Okay, so uh, the time is 9.15. So we are going to get started because we have a lot of material to go through today. And uh, I want to make sure that we can get through it all. And of course, if we encounter any uh, internet instability issues, um, hopefully we can resolve those quickly. Um, so today we are going to be basically um, talking about quality control in data pre-processing as an introduction to bacterial genomics. My name is Jill Ramore. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases here at the University of Manitoba. So just some housekeeping items. So all workshops, of course, are being recorded and they will be posted to the Bioinformatics Workshop YouTube channel after the workshop. Uh, for live Q&A, uh, please go to Slido and use the particip participant code that's listed on the slide. Alternatively, you can post your questions in the chat, which is be mo being monitored by both Rose and Farrell. So just to recap of the workshops that we have offered to date, as well as upcoming workshops, um, they're listed here in the slide. Uh, please make sure if you'd like to attend them that you are registering. Um, just a quick comment about the April 20th and April 27th. Um, this, these workshops are being left open intentionally. So this allows you to bring your own data set um, if you have any questions or if you have any questions about past workshops. Um, if, for example, if you couldn't install a tool or if you couldn't get one of the examples to run, this is a great opportunity for you to bring that um, to uh, the workshops and we can help you out with that. Now, while we will be offering these both online and in person, I would recommend coming in person for these particular workshops because it's much easier to help you when you're here and you can show us your data set as opposed to trying to troubleshoot online. And for those in the room, just make sure that you are connected uh, to the Wi-Fi using the appropriate login credentials. And everyone should be familiar with that. Okay, so um, really the overall goal of today's workshop is to provide demonstrations and exercises for performing basic bioinformatic analysis of bacterial genomic data as it pertains to both quality control and data pre-processing. And these are really critical to obtaining high quality data for downstream analysis. Now for today's workshop, I'm gonna be specifically focusing on short read data that's been generated by the Illumina platform. And this is for single isolates. Now, a lot of the tools that we're gonna be using today can be applied to metagenomic data sets as well as long read data. So the specific learning objectives uh, for today's workshop are going to include using a publicly available data set to assess general data quality using FastQC. We're gonna filter out low quality reads using FastP. Um, we're also going to look at removing host sequence content using Bowtie 2 and SAM tools. SAM tools, uh, Grace had gone over that tool in her previous workshop using long read data. Now we're gonna be using short read data using the same tool. So a little bit of famili familiarity there. Um, and then next we're going to assess assembled sequence data using one of my favorite tools, CheckM. Now, I just want to, I have this little disclaimer here. Now, for today's workshop, I'm gonna be running all tools with default settings. Now, default settings aren't always the best. So I recommend giving careful consideration of the analysis parameters in the context of your research question. Um, so you really have to do your due diligence when using these tools um, and optimizing them to fit your needs. Okay, so we're going to get started right away. And what we're going to do is just to make sure that everything runs smoothly, um, let's open up our terminals. Okay. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to navigate to that Conda workshop folder that we've previously created on our desktop. Okay. So to, to do that, we're going to go... Now, everyone's computers might be different depending on where you put that folder, um, but most people would have put it in their desk on their desktop. Okay, so we're going to navigate to that. So we can see here that I am now in my Conda Workshop folder on my desktop. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make a new directory for this particular workshop and for next week's workshop called Bacterial Genomics. So we do that by typing the command mkdir, so for make directory, and we're going to call it bacterial genomics. Okay, press enter. Now, to make sure the directory is created, we're going to list. Okay, we can see it there. It's highlighted in green, meaning it's a directory. And don't worry about this file. You won't have that file. Um, I've just downloaded it just in case it does not download um, when we get to that point. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to open up our internet browser. 
Okay, oops. And we are going to go to the um, workshop GitHub. Okay, everyone should be familiar with that. This is where you would have had to have downloaded the slides for today's workshop. Now, what we're going to do first is we're going to clone the directory. So we're going to get all the files that we need for the most part. Um, some of the files that we're using today are quite large. So those had to be um, uploaded to a Dropbox, which we will be downloading um, after we clone our uh, repository. Okay, so once you copy the link, going to return to your terminal. Okay, and so it should be git clone and then we're cloning our entire, the repository for our bacterial genomics workshop. Okay, I'm gonna press enter. Okay, now we're gonna make sure that that um, repository was created. Okay, and we can see it. So we have our bacterial genomics folder and then we have um, our clone directory. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do now is we're actually going to download uh, the FASTQ data set to our bacterial genomics directory. So we're going to go back um, to our um, MMID repository, and we're going to click on this first link here, which says to download the FASTQ data set. Um, and that's from this particular paper, which I'll, I'll talk about in the next few slides uh, quickly. Um, but basically, it's um, two um, data sets, uh, Bibrio parahemolyticus uh, from uh, Jesser AL uh, that was published back in Frontiers in 2019. Okay, so let's click on that. Okay, and we're just gonna click download. So we can see here, we have two samples. Um, we have, and they have an R1 and R2, because like I said, we're gonna be working today with short, um, short read paired end data. Okay, so we're gonna navigate to our desktop, right? Where we have our Conda workshop folder. And that's where we're going to be saving it in bacterial genomics. Okay, and we're just going to click save. So we're going to let that download. Now, in the meantime, we're going to go back and we're going to download um, our Bowtie 2 index as well, because this is going to take some time. So we're going to return to that repository, click on this link, and we're going to be putting it in the same directory. Okay. So we're going to click download. Now, because I already have it downloaded, I'm not going to re-download it, but um, again, we're going to the desktop, Conda Workshop, um, and then we are going to put it into our bacterial genomics folder, and then you would just click save, okay? Okay, so we're gonna move on. We'll come back once our um, FASTQ uh, files have been downloaded, and we'll unzip those after. Okay. And then of course, um, with all these demonstrations, I've um, also included uh, some commentary so that if you are not able to follow along during the workshop, you can always go back and revisit. Okay. Okay, so basically what I have illustrated in this slide is just a basic workflow for bacterial genomic data analysis. Now, a common first step um, is to run a variety of computational tools for quality control, which identify and remove low quality sequences as well as contaminants. And those all often include um, sequences that are derived from the host genome. Now, after we do our quality control, the reads can either be assembled, um, um, assembled into contigs or scaffolds, or they can be passed directly to taxonomic classifiers, which we are gonna be talking about in next week's workshop, along with reference databases. Now, further downstream analysis can include, but of course is not limited to visualizations, um, which we're gonna be covering in next week's workshop using Pavian, where we're gonna look at Kraken 2 reports, it's also going to be covered in the April 13th workshop where um, Taylor is going to be uh, using R and GGTree to visualize phylogenies. Um, we also have the option we can do characterization. So that would include things like AMR and virulence profiling. Um, unfortunately, we won't be covering that in uh, this year's workshop, but um, definitely something that um, is um, pretty popular in some downstream analyses. And then, of course, um, we can also do some phylogenetic analysis, um, and that is going to be introduced in the April 6th workshop that Taylor is also going to be teaching. So I'm sure many of you are aware that um, modern high throughput sequencers can generate ton tens of millions of sequences um, in a single run. Now, before analyzing the data, you should always perform some simple quality checks 
uh, to ensure that the data looks good and there are no issues. Now, most sequences, sequencers will generate a QC report as part of their analysis, but um, this is only focused on identifying actual issues with the sequencer. For example, uh, the sequence analysis viewer, um, which is provided by Illumina, um, is an application that can tell you, tell you in real time um, sort of what's going on with the sequencer and how the run is progressing. Now, other tools like FastQC, which is a very popular tool, and I'm sure a major number of you have probably heard of it, um, it basically provides uh, an overview of the basic quality control metrics for next generation sequencing data, and it reports multiple QC metrics. And they're sort of reported on a, a traffic light system. So a green would indicate really good data. Orange or this uh, sort of yellow color would be uh, potentially some issues. So maybe abnormal. And then, of course, red would mean that the data is probably not the best. So it really makes it easy to uh, interpret um, the results from FastQC and identify whether or not your data has any issues before you start any downstream analysis. So one of the, the things about FastQC is it offers a number of metrics, and we're not going to go through all of them today, but one of the quality control metrics that I find to be the most useful and the most um, sort of tell, tell sign that your data has any issues with it is the per base sequence quality. Now, this measures the probability that a base is called incorrectly. So since the focus of today's workshop is on paired end Illumina short read data, the figures presented in the slide represent the per base sequence quality um, for the forward read on the left, and then we have the reverse read on the right. Now, the length of the read is indicated in base pairs along the x-axis, and then the quality score we have indicated along the y-axis. Now, we want the majority um, of the length of the reads to have a score that's greater than or equal to 30, which we can see here is 99.9% .9 base calling accuracy. So a probability of one in a thousand of an incorrect base call. Now, a quick way to screen uh, for this is to ensure that most of the yellow boxes that you see here are in that green zone. Now, I just wanna point out that the second read or R2 will always have slightly lower quality than your first read. And this is because, you know, by the time it's starting to sequence your um, second read, the reagents on the sequence are beginning to run out. So it's, it's expected. But again, we still want to make sure that most of those uh, yellow bars are falling within uh, that green section. So based on what I've sort of talked about in the previous slide, what do you, do you think this data set would pass? You can give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, right. Thumbs down. Exactly. Perfect. Okay, so just to touch on the database or the data set that we're going to be using today. So it comes from a paper that was published in uh, Frontiers in Public Health. So the data sets are Vibrio parahemolyticus. I haven't really chose it for any rhyme or reason. Um, it was just a nice data set. Uh, now, most of them are coming from this cluster in particular. Um, so I've uploaded two of these samples uh, to the GitHub, which we are currently downloading. Okay, so now we're going to try running FastQC on our own, because we should have our FastQ files, they should be downloaded. Okay. So we're going to return to the terminal. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're just going to do a little ls, we're going to see Okay, so we're gonna go into our bacterial genomics folder if you're not already there. So we're just gonna CD into that, I guess. Okay, so LS. So we can see here we have our FASTQ file. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna unzip it. So Dropbox zips it, and then we have to go in and um, decompress our gzipped uh, FASTQ files. So we're just gonna type the command unzip, FASTQ. You can go tab complete. Okay, enter and it's going to extract the files. I was going to take a little moment here. But so far, so good. <laughs> so we should have four FASTQ files once the file is unzipped.
Okay. So it shouldn't take too long. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is now we are going to, so they're G-zipped, which is indicated by this GZ um, extension. So to decompress those files, we're just going to simply run the same command, but with the G in front for G unzip. And then we have multiple files. So we're going to put an asterisk as the wild card, right? And then we're going to put our file extension because we want to unzip them all. Okay, and we're going to press enter. Taking a little while. Has anyone's unzipped? It looks like they're making their way. Sorry, there'll be a little bit of waiting throughout the workshop just to get everything going. But in the meantime, are there any questions in the room at all? Everyone's able to follow along okay? Okay. Okay, let me take a look. And we can see now we no longer have that uh, .gz extension, so everything's been decompressed. Now, the next thing we're going to do um, is we are going to uh, make a new directory called FastQ, um, which we are going to move our FastQ files in there. Um, and this is just to get practice using those commands, as well as just organizing the day a little bit better. So to do that, we're going to go move, and then we're going to use that wildcard again. We're going to go dot FastQ, and we're going to, oops, I guess I have to make it first. So first, we're going to make our FastQ directory. So I'm make directory, FastQ. Okay. Then we're going to move our FastQ files into the FastQ directory. Okay. And then what you should see when you type the ls command is that they should no longer be in the bacterial genomics folder. Now they're in their own separate FastQ folder. Okay. And we can see that by moving into the FastQ directory and listing the contents of the directory. Okay. So now we're going to move out of that directory. And we're just going to go back to our uh, bacterial genomics directory. So it's moving up. Oops, just one directory. Okay, so we're back where we started. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to activate our Conda workshop environment. And that contains the tools um, that we would have installed for the previous workshops, which contains FastQC. So we're going to go Conda activate and then Conda workshop. So now we can see here that the Conda workshop environment is activated because it appears beside our name. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a new directory called FastQC reports so that we can put our output from FastQC into this directory. So FastQC underscore reports. Okay, and that's in the bacterial genomics folder. And then we can make sure again, if you just want to double check that you made it, and list the contents of the directory. And we can see here now we have a new directory called FastQC reports. Okay. So the command to run FastQC, we're going to FastQC. And then we want to direct it to where our FastQ files are, which we put them in the FastQ directory. Okay. And we want to run it on all of our FastQ files. So we're going to put the wildcard. Okay. And then we're going to point it to our output, what we just created 
which is our fast QC reports. I think is someone at the door. Okay, so that's the basic command uh, to run fast QC, and we're going to press enter. And as it runs along, it'll print to the console as it moves uh, through the different steps. Now, one thing kind of while it's running, I do want to stress, and I, I don't think we've had time in previous workshops, is that if you are participating in these workshops using the high performance compute, computing cluster at the NML, um, it's very, very, very important that you are using the Slurm workload manager to submit all of your jobs. Otherwise, these jobs could potentially be run on the head node. Um, and now that can cause disruptions to those who are actually running routine activities and high priority tasks at the NML. So it's very, very important um, that you are always exercising good cluster etiquette anytime you use that high performance computing cluster. And it doesn't apply for everyone in the room if you're running this off your own computer, you can just disregard that. But just wanted to make sure that, uh, that we're not causing any disruptions um, to those who are actually um, doing work over at the NML. Okay, so while that's running, we're just gonna go back and we're gonna move through some of the, um, the other slides. Okay, so we've gone through all of that. And then there's that just that reminder about using the Slurm uh, workload manager. And I did uh, provide a very detailed instruction in last year's workshop, and I provided that link there if you'd like to visit it. And I would highly recommend. Okay, so the next step in the workflow once we've assessed the general data quality is to identify and remove low quality sequences, adapters, and contaminants. Um, traditionally, a different tool is used for each of these. So I've included some examples of, of common tools that are used to remove adapters as well as read pruning and filtering. But it can become quite cumbersome and you often have to load the data multiple times. So it really isn't as efficient as it can be. So to simplify FastQ processing, FastP was developed and it's basically an all-in-one FastQ processor. So it provides functions including quality profiling, adapter trimming, read trimming, and base correction. Um, it supports both single end sequencing and paired end short read or single end and paired end read or short read data, as well as basic support for long read data. But um, I haven't personally used it for long read data. There are a lot of other tools out there that probably work a lot better, but for short read data, it works pretty well. So this is an example of what a summary report um, generated by FASTP looks like. So it reports the statistical values for the pre-filtering um, and post-filtering of the data to facilitate comparisons between the data um, after the filtering is complete. So I'll kind of give you an idea of how many sequences were filtered out and why. Now, because um, we have a lot of material to cover today, um, I won't have enough time to go through the entire report, which is quite lengthy for FASTP, um, but I have included um, a link to Aaron Petkow's workshop, which he gave last year on bacterial um, genome assembly, where he goes through the FASTP outfit, uh, output in quite detail. So I would highly recommend uh, you visiting that uh, workshop when you have a moment. Okay, so now we're going to go and try running FASTP on our own. Okay, so what we're going to do is we don't have to activate the environment because we already have that activated. Oh, I guess it's going to take a little bit longer here. It's almost done. <laughs> I think, yeah. Is everyone's uh, fast QC progressing sort of at the same speed? We're kind of all around where we have the last read being processed. Okay, perfect. I think we should be okay. It's the bow tie. <laughs> It'll take a little while, but we'll see.
Okay. Perfect. Okay, so hopefully everyone's has completed or is very near completion. So now what we're going to do is we're going to run fast P. We don't need to reactivate our con environment because it's already been installed in this environment, or at least it should have been. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to create a new directory called fast P, and this is where we're going to put our result or output for fast P, and it's going to be in the bacterial genomics directory. Okay, now we're going to run the tool. So we have fast P, and then we're going to point it to our fast Q reads. Um, and we're going to run um, 2368311. Okay, that's the one we're going to be running today. So we have our first read, then we have our second read, where it's the same directory, so fast Q. And then we have the R2 extension. Now we're going to tell fast P where to put our output. So for our reads, so we have uh, lowercase o, and we're going to put that in our fast P directory. And we're going to call that the same by the same name. So um, SAMN 0236-8311. And then we're going to put a dash fast P that we know that we ran fast P on it, R1 dot fast Q. And then we have our second read because it is paired and read or paired M data. And we're going to put that in the same directory as well. Okay. And then make sure we add that fast Q extension. Okay. Then we're going to create an HTML report, um, which contains all of the results and the summary report um, that you can take a look at after the workshop. And we're also going to put that in the same directory. And of course, we're going to call it by the same name. So we know that it is um, uh, from this particular sample. And then that'll be an HTML. Okay. And then we're also going to create a JSON file. And some programs require a JSON file. Um, I uh, we won't be looking at that or talking about that, but um, but it's just something a feature that FastP offers um, for downstream tools if needed. Okay. Once you have everything entered in, make sure I have my. Okay. And we're just gonna let the tool run. Okay. In the meantime, I'm gonna go back and just wanna make sure it's running. Should run. Yep. Okay. So I mentioned kind of earlier on, sort of when I gave that basic workflow of bacterial genomics, that if a data set comes from a host with a sequenced genome, uh, for example, human, a lot of clinical samples, right, they come from human. So it's really useful to identify and filter out host reads before any further analysis. Now, this can considerably reduce uh, the number of sets of reads making subsequent steps faster. And this is um, even more, maybe not as useful for single isolates, but for metagenomic data sets, extremely useful. Now, there's a number of tools that can accomplish this. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on Bowtie 2. Um, I know Grace touched on Minimap in our last workshop. And then, of course, there's other tools like BWA Mem. Okay. So I don't think we've installed this package um, in our Conda environment yet. So I think everyone's had, oh, we have a question. Oh, for the, for running fast P? Okay. And to all of the code that I'm running today is also listed. Um, it's also uh, documented in the slides. Um, so, um, if you, if you miss anything, it's also there as well. And for you to go back to, were they able to resolve? Okay, perfect. Awesome. <laughs> That's great. Okay. So we're going to install Bowtie 2. Um, so we're going to just return to our terminal. Um, if you haven't already installed it, so we're going to do that in our Conda workshop environment. So, right, remember the command conda install, yes to the prompts, and we're going to direct it to the channel, which comes from bioconda, and then the tool, okay? I'm not going to install it because I already have it installed, um, but if you don't, this is the command that you would run, uh, make sure that it's in your environment, and it shouldn't take too long, okay? Okay, so while that's installing, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Bowtie 2 indexes. 
So I think Grace touched a bit on this as well in her presentation, um, just about indexing in general. So prior to mapping, most aligners will require you to index the genome. And that basically allows the aligner to quickly, oh yeah, good question. Um, I, yes, I, I dispatch everything, even from unzipping files, copying files, yeah. Moving files if they're large. <laughs> it's just it's just good cluster etiquette to always have that um, in front of any command that you're running on the high performance computing cluster. Okay, so you can sort of think as an index. Um, it's kind of like similar to an index, like a book in a book. Um, so if you want to know which page a certain word appears or a chapter, um, it's more efficient to look it up in this index rather than searching through every page um, for the throughout the book until you find what you're looking for. Now, while you can build your own indexes uh, for Bowtie 2, um, this is a bit beyond the scope of today's workshop. So I've included a couple of online resources that host pre-built uh, indices uh, for commonly encountered reference genomes, um, especially the human genome. Um, now, today we're going to be using the human genome uh, Bowtie 2 index that comes from the Illumina iGenomes website. Um, and then we're going to be doing that and aligning that to our, our samples that we downloaded. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next demonstration where we're going to run Bowtie 2. Okay, and again, um, I do have a step by step guide that if uh, for some reason um, you're not able to follow along, uh, you can always refer to the step by step guide, and it's exactly uh, what we'll be doing um, in the console. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to make a new directory for our bowtie2 output, and we're going to call that host filtered. So again, that make directory command, and we're going to call it host filtered. Okay. Make sure we've created that. Great. Okay. So then what we're going to do is we've downloaded that bowtie2 index at the beginning of the class. It should have completed downloading by now. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to decompress it. Um, so I just have to quickly move mine because I have it in this one. So you don't have to follow along with this. I'm just going to um, move my Bowtie 2 index into my bacterial genomics. Okay. Okay, so... I have my Bowtie 2 index, which you should also have, and we see that it's tar gzipped. So to uncompress it, we are going to type in tar dash x. So that instructs the tar to extract lines from the zip file. V for verbose, or basically just list the files it's extracting so you can see what, what uh, files you have. And then Z, um, we want to tell tar to decompress the files because um, otherwise you'll have a folder full of compressed files. And then, of course, the file name. So that's going to be our Bowtie 2 index. Okay. And then we're going to press enter. Now, you might get an error message depending on how much space you have on your desktop. <laughs> it might not fully decompress. I had this issue because I had the index um, in multiple folders because I was uh, running some tests. Um, if you do get that error, um, unfortunately, you will have to clear some documents from your desktop to allow that to fully decompress. Um, but again, if you can't do that right now, I wouldn't expect you to. Um, there are the instructions that you can go back to and try this on your own. Okay, I think we're still good for time. How's everyone's, are their files decompressing? Okay, okay. Any issues online at all? No, okay. Yes, Grace? I'm saying that their file isn't part of that TZ, but just part. Oh, it's just, oh. Oh, because I think when we g-zipped, I yeah, that's right. I forgot um, that it was in there. Um, so we'll just uh, untar it. Um, so that would just mm 
or dash x value. Yeah, yeah. Yes, because we probably, when we were um, uh, decompressing our gzip files with gzip, um, I forgot that we were downloading our bowtie 2 index at the same time, which is also gzipped. So that inadvertently gzipped that file, which just left the tar extension. But there's um, an easy way to get around that. Grace has typed it in the chat. Uh, you would just simply run tar uh, exec, and that would untar the file for you. Okay, so now that we have decompressed our Bowtie 2 index, um, the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to run Bowtie 2. So we're going to type Bowtie 2. Then we're going to point to our index. So with the dash X, and we're going to point to, um, so it would be our Bowtie. Well, actually, I should show you first. So when we un or decompress the, the file, what you'll see here is now it's created a new directory called Bowtie 2 index. And that's where that index is going to be saved and we have to direct Bowtie2 to, to it. So Bowtie2, okay, pointing to our index, which is in Bowtie2. Um, we can tab complete. So it's called uh, genome. Uh, we don't want the period at the end because that will cause an error. Um, so again, if you just go into the Bowtie2 index, and if you just do a tab complete, it'll pop up because that's the only file that's in there. And we just want to make sure we're getting rid of that period, okay? Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to point to where our fast uh, P files are because, right, we want to do it on the filtered data. Um, we don't want to run it on our raw data because we just did all this work to remove all the low quality reads. We want to make sure we're running it on that. Okay, so we're going to point it to our first read, which is in our fast P file. Okay, and there should only be one um, for each of the R1 and R2. Okay, so we'll put the fast P R1. Okay, now we're going to point it to our second read, which is also in the fast P directory. Okay. And then we want the dash fast P and our R2. Okay. And then we're gonna tell it we want the output um, to go in our host filter directory. Okay, so that's our output or a SAM file. Um, and then we're gonna put it into our host filter directory, which we created. And we're going to call it, again, the same name as our sample. Okay. And we're going to attach the dot .sam extension. Okay. So we're creating output sam file with this dash s. And then we're going to hit enter. And it's, again, it's going to print to the console as it works through, as the tool works through um, analyzing the data. And just to check, everyone in the room is following along okay and everyone online? Okay. I know it's a bit slower, but um, but this way it allows everyone um, to sort of catch up if there are any issues um, or if you have any technical difficulties. So hopefully, don't mind the waiting too much. And I think we're still good for time, which is good, I think, because I just said one more exercise. We go.
It's getting there. So once this is done running, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to convert our SAM to BAM. Um, and this is something you should always do. Uh, BAM files are much more compact than SAM files. They're easier to manipulate and work with in downstream tools. Um, so it's just one quick script, which I'll show you guys how to do. Um, so that's just best practice, just even for data storage as well. Perfect. Okay, and it also print the stats um, to the console as well. So it looks like the sam this particular sample has a very, very, very low <laughs> amount of host DNA. Um, and that's typically what you'd see in stool, um, not very much, unless of course um, it's a bloody stool sample. Um, so this is kind of what we would expect. And, and two, it's possible that before submission to NCBI, the authors did um, their due diligence and they processed the data and removed host DNA before upload. Okay, so as I mentioned, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to convert that SAM to BAM. So we're going to go into the directory where we saved our SAM file. So remember, that's host filtered. So we're going to change directory into host filtered. Okay, now we're in there. We're going to list the contents, make sure our file was created. Yep, it's there. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use SAM tools. And we're going to go view and we're going to change it to BAM. Okay. And then we're going to put in our SAM file. So you can just tab complete because there's only one. Um, so it will tab complete for you. And then we're going to point that to creating a BAM file. And we just change the exact same sample name. We're just changing the extension to BAM. Okay. And we're going to press enter. So it shouldn't take as long. I'm just going to make sure that everything is progressing as it should. Yep. So it'll be about half the size of the SAM file. Just to check everyone. It's good in the room and online. Okay, perfect. Almost there. Okay. So most of you should be finished up. We're very close to finishing up. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is now that we have our BAM file, we're going to make a new directory um, in host filter directory called unmapped. Okay, because that we want to extract all of the unmapped reads because those are the reads that are going to correspond to our organism of interest and not the host. Okay. So make directory unmapped. And we're just gonna make sure it's created. We can see that it's there in the green by listing the contents. 
Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to run SAM tools again. Okay, view, and we want to create a BAM file. So the dash B, and then, so this dash F here, 12. So this is a SAM flag. So basically what we're saying is we only want to extract alignments with both reads that are unmapped. The uppercase F followed by 256 means that we want just primary alignments. Now, SAM tools flags can be quite complicated um, and there are many of them. Um, I've included a um, website at the end of the workshop where you can go and easily check out different SAM flags by typing them in a box and it returns to you what they mean. So I use this tool quite often because <laughs> I don't know all the SAM flags. So it's kind of a nice reference um, to, to go to. And, you know, depending on what you want to do, um, it will let you know what um, identifiers you need to include in your script. OK, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to point to our BAM file that we just created. OK, and then we're going to direct our new output, which is our unmapped reads um, to the unmapped directory. Okay, and we're going to call it again, our same sample name. And we're going to underscore unmapped. So we know it's just the unmapped reads and with the BAM extension. Okay. And it'll be very similar in size um, to our previously, the BAM file that we previously made. And that's because we had very little reads um, mapping to the human genome. So it'll be very similar. So once this is finished running, um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to sort the BAM file uh, by read name. And that's because we're working with paired end data. So we want to make sure that the reads, um, basically the read names are right beside each other. So that helps for downstream analysis when we're trying to extract that into two separate reads again, or R1 and R2. Um, and again, with sorting it, that's something you should always do. Um, it allows basically the data to be more efficiently displayed. Um, and then of course, a lot of downstream tools actually require sorted BAM files as well. Okay, so it's already, that was quick. Okay, so as I mentioned, now we're going to sort our BAM file that's in our unmapped directory. Um, so we're going to move into that directory using the CD command. Okay, now we're in the unmapped directory and we're going to make a new directory called sorted. So we want to make sure that we're just keeping all of our data sets separate. Uh, you don't have to do this. This is a personal preference. If you just want to add underscores or uh, delineate your different samples with different naming schemes, it's totally up to you. Okay, so we're going to make a new directory called sorted. And now we're going to sort our BAM file. So we're going to go SAM tools sort. Um, again, right, the dash N is making sure that our read names are next to each other. And then our output dash O, we're going to put it in our sorted directory. And then we're going to make sure we're typing the exact same sample name. And then I like to add the underscore, the um, sorted. And then, of course, it's a BAM file. And then we want to tell SAM tools that we want to make the output format BAM. We want to keep it as BAM. And then we're going to put our input file, which is that's unmapped BAM file. And then hit enter. Okay. And then the next thing we're going to do um, once this finishes running, again, shouldn't take too long, is we're going to convert our BAM file to back into FASTQ because we need to be able to have the data usable um, for downstream analysis like taxonomic classification. Um, so we will be using this data set next week uh, to perform taxonomic classification, okay? So don't delete this folder. <laughs> Not until the end of the workshop. <laughs>
So I guess depending on the That should be finished up. Perfect. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to convert the BAM files to FASTQ. So we're going to move into our output directory, which is sorted. So again, change directory, CD, sorted. Okay. Now we're going to run SAM tools, FASTQ. There's a lot of options I should mention for converting BAM to FASTQ. I've chosen to use SAM tools today. There's other tools um, that you can use, such as bed tools, which is quite popular. Um, so again, it's a personal preference. So we're going to add the at sign, um, and that's just to speed it up with the two threads. I'm not sure how fast that will speed it up, but we're going to try. Um, and now we're going to point to our, or this is going to be our output. So we want, um, again, our sample name, and I'm going to attach an HR, meaning that it's host removed. And then we're going to go write our underscore r one dot fastq, and then we have our second read, which is going to be the exact same thing, but with the underscore r two uh, extension. Okay, and then we're going to point it to our sorted BAM file because that's where we're getting the reads from. Okay. And we're going to let this run. It's going to take a while, but we're going to go back to the slides um, just in the interest of time. Okay. So again, just a step-by-step -step guide. Okay. So today I won't be focusing on bacterial genome assembly because um, that was covered in last year's workshop series uh, by Aaron Petkow. Um, but I would, like I said earlier, I would strongly encourage you to visit uh, that website because he does give a very thorough description of bacterial genome assemblies. But what I will be talking about um, is CheckM. And this is a really great tool and a tool that I use quite often. Um, and it basically provides a set of tools for assessing the quality of genomes recovered from isolates, single cells, or metagenomes. So it's quite versatile. Now, two metrics that I found particularly useful are completeness and contamination. Um, so these can actually give you a really good idea of whether or not your assembly uh, is of good quality and therefore you know, um, suitable for further downstream analysis. Now, within CheckM, there's two workflows. Uh, so we have lineage specific and taxonomy specific. So um, they do provide great explanations on uh, the wiki for situations when to use each of these workflows. However, just kind of a general rule, uh, when you have genomes that come from different taxonomic groups, you're going to want to use the lineage workflow. And if it's all coming from the same taxonomic group, like in our case, Vibrio, um, we can run the taxonomy workflow, which we will be running today. Okay, so we're going to run CheckM. All right, so what we're gonna do um, is we're gonna now make a directory. So we're gonna move out of the sorted directory because we don't wanna make it in there. So we're gonna go up back to our bacterial genomics directory. Okay, so that should be up probably three levels depending on how you've uh, created your directories. Okay, so we're gonna make a directory called check M. And now we're going to go into our repository that was, um, oops, I gotta go back one. So we're going to have to go up one more level, but we're going to go into that repository that we cloned. So the 2023 bacterial genomics, because this is where the FASTA files or the assemblies were downloaded to. Um, and the FASTA files, they were created uh, using the assembler Skiza, um, just for, for anyone who might be interested. And again, Aaron goes through that in his workshop. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into our assemblies directory. And these full files are uh, compressed. So we're going to unzip them, G unzip, because they're .gz. And then again, we can just supply the wildcard because we want to unzip them both. And that should be fairly quick. They're much smaller than our FASTQ data sets. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get out of this directory. So again, using the CD command, change directory, and we're gonna go up to. 
levels. Back into our, oops, just one level. So we want to make sure we're in our bacterial genomics uh, directory. Oh, is it, am I going too fast? Okay. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get pause for a moment and let people catch up. So um, what you should have done so far is just make your check M directory. Um, unzipped the FASTA files that are in the assemblies SCISA folder that was downloaded um, as part of the repository. And then now we just want to return back to the bacterial genomics folder or directory. And just to make sure we have our check M output folder there. Perfect. Okay. Because yeah, this will be the last exercise for today. Um, we're not going to unfortunately be able to see the results of check M. Um, it does take about eight minutes to run. I mean, if, you, if you'd like to stick around and wait for the results to complete, you're more than welcome to. Um, but like I said, it takes around eight to 10 minutes. It's quite lengthy. <laughs> Are we okay? Okay, so we're going to move on to actually running the tool. So we're going to, and hopefully everyone has check M installed in their Conda workshop environment. I know Grace had, uh, had asked everyone to do that at last week's workshop and just to double check. So we're gonna run check M. And like I said, we're running the taxonomy workflow, okay? And then we know our data sets come from Vibrio. So we're going to indicate the genus Vibrio. Okay. And now we're going to point to where our assemblies are. So the nice thing about CheckM is it can run on an entire directory containing assemblies. So you don't point to each individual assembly. Um, you can actually run them all at once, which is quite nice. And that's why they've provided the options for the lineage or the taxonomy workflow. Okay. So we're going to navigate to that. So remember, that's in our um, bacterial. Uh, genomics uh, repository and in the assembly schiza. So we can just leave it like that. We're pointing to the directory and uh, the tool knows to look for the FASTA files um, in that particular directory. Now we're going to point our output to our check M directory that we made. Okay. And then we're going to add two threads. So that's the dash T to try and maybe speed things up. And then we're going to make sure we include the FASTA extension uh, because by default, check M recognizes the dot FNA. And if you don't include this dash X FASTA, um, typically an error will arise and it won't be able to identify the file. Okay. And we're going to press enter. Oh, I guess I did not install Conda in... I did not install it in my Conda workshop environment, but that's okay. I have it here. <laughs> so um, same thing. We're going to run. Okay. So we're going to run it in an environment that has check M. <laughs> oh, I know why. That's my fault. Um, so it is not an uppercase M. That is a typo on my part. I wish this would not stop right here. Okay, so sorry, it's a lowercase m. That's why. Um, and then we will just run the tool and it should now run as, yep. Okay, so I'm going to return back because we are pretty much out of time. But basically, um, I wanted to show you what the output looks like. So um, we can see here, so once check M is done running and we run our QA workflow, which is that next step under running check M, um, which if you do stick around, we can run. Um, if not, um, it would definitely be a good idea to try it on your own, but it will generate this report. Um, in the meantime, if you do not run the QA workflow, it will print the results to your console. So you will see the completeness and contamination as well. I believe you'll see um, up to this point contamination, but you won't see um, columns H or I. So we can see here that our genomes are actually quite good quality. So pretty much 100% completeness and very, very, very low contamination. Now, there are a number of other statistics that are reported uh, by CheckM when we use the QA workflow. Um, and I would encourage you to visit uh, their wiki um, and just familiarize yourself with some of the reported statistics because they may be of use um, in your own research. 
So above and beyond um, the links that were included in the workshop, I've also included a few extra resources um, that might be of use to you in the future. Um, I would also encourage you to try and attempt these exercises on your own. Try downloading other publicly available data sets, or you can also try running it on the other FASTQ data set that we didn't look at today. Now for next week's workshop, just another reminder that we will be using um, the FASTQ data sets. So uh, please try to avoid deleting the folder because otherwise I'm um, gonna have to spend some time re-downloading um, um, and getting everything prepared for next week's workshop. Okay. So of course, thank you everyone for attending. Um, I hope you learned something new today. Or um, if you didn't, maybe um, it's you know just a chance for you to brush up on existing skills. Um, and of course, I just want to remind everyone really just to take the time to please, please, please fill out the exit survey. Um, this is really important for us, um, especially with respect to helping us improve the delivery of future workshops. Yes. So the FASTQ data sets um, so that we had processed through um, sort of the workflow that we did today. So those will be the ones that we um, filtered the host genome. So it'll be the dash HR at the end. Yes, the ones that we made today. Yeah. So that'll save people a lot of time from having to re-download data sets and taking up space on your computer. So I'm trying to make it as efficient as possible for everyone because <laughs> I know we have a lot of stuff on our computers.